Hi everyone, back with chapter four in the Great Horn Spoon, The Pig Hunt. Jack began to dread Sunday dinners. It was bound to be good luck's turn at them on the menu soon. The pig no longer came trotting after him, it was true, for Jack had tied up the pen to make it escape proof, but the porker remained on his mind, if not at his heels. And then, with Rio de Janeiro only a few days away, Jack saw the cook leave the galley with a heavy meat cleaver in his hand. Good grief, thought Jack, he's going for good luck. Without a second thought, Jack went sliding down the nearest ladder. When the cook arrived at the animal pens, the porker was gone, and so was Jack. It's that boy, he shouted, waving the meat cleaver. Pigs is for eatin', not for pets. Soon, even the gold seekers joined in the pig hunt, for the promise of fresh pork made their mouths water. They looked above decks and below decks. They glanced at masts and down ventilators. The cook himself went searching through the cargo hold where Monsieur Gaunt, a Frenchman in the rough homespuns of a farmer, was watering his precious grape cuttings. Have you seen a pig down here? growled the cook. No, Monsieur, answered the Frenchman, Frenchman but rat, we. Oui. The chase continued. The pig hunters looked everywhere but the captain's stateroom, which was fortunate for Jack and good luck were hiding behind the open door. Not a sound out of you, whispered Jack. The pig, snorting out of sheer love, rubbed his ever-fattening side against Jack's leg. Shh! Just then, the captain himself could be heard approaching along the passageway. But when he entered his cabin, there was no sign of pig or boy. He hung up his blue cap, yawned, and took a nap. When he was sound asleep, Jack and Goodluck crept out from under the bunk, where there was hardly room to breathe. Jack looked around, wondering what to do next. It seemed hopeless, but he wasn't going to deliver up the porker to the cook without a battle. Leaning his bristle back against Jack's leg, the pig grunted a loud word of endearment and almost woke the captain. Jack's breath caught. Any port in a storm, he told himself, and ran. He made a beeline toward his own cabin with good luck trotting along behind. At that moment, Mountain Jim happened along the passageway, and the pig went through his bowed legs. If many gold seekers had joined in the hunt, others considered it sport to outwit the cook. Mountain Jim merely turned to give Jack a wink and went on his way. Once in his cabin, Jack stopped short. Dr. Buckby was stretched out for a nap and snoring loudly. Moving on his toes, Jack approached his hammock. He would wrap good luck in a blanket and hide him in the hammock. But when Jack turned, his breath caught again. The porker had his two front hooves on Dr. Buckby's bunk and had leaned his head closer to see what all the snoring was about. The horse doctor awoke. He found himself staring into a strange grunting face, thinking he was being set upon by map robbers, for he was more asleep than awake. He began to blow in his tin alarm trumpet. Jack was horrified. The trumpeting sounded like a sick elephant. It would bring the entire ship. It's only us, Dr. Buckby, Jack cried, but he couldn't be heard over the blare of the horn. There was no way out of the cabin but the door, and it was too late for that. Quickly, Jack got his arms around good luck, climbed on a sea chest, and tried to stuff the porker through the brass portal. But good luck got stuck half in and half out. Jack put a shoulder to the job, but it was no use. You're done for now, Jack exclaimed. Praiseworthy, hearing the alarm trumpet, was first in the cabin. What's this? he said, sizing up the situation quickly. A pig in a porthole? Have you seen the cook? asked Jack desperately. He was still pushing against the pig's fat rump. A few paces behind, said Praiseworthy, opening his black umbrella. umbrella. Step aside, Master Jack. When the cook entered, together with several gold seekers, there was no pig to be seen. Praiseworthy had taken up a position directly in front of the porthole 
porthole with this umbrella blocking the view. By then, Dr. Buckby had stopped trumpeting. Robbers, he said, trying to get my map. I almost caught one of them, a big fellow with fat cheeks. A mere dream, said Praiseworthy. The cook raised his meat cleaver again. There's the boy. Where's my pig? Pig, said Praiseworthy. What pig? He's got it. And Praiseworthy turned to Jack. Pig, pig. Master Jack, do you have your pockets inside out? Our chef seems to think you have a pig about you. The gold seekers began to laugh. There's no robber in here or pig either. Come on, boys. But the cook turned at the door, squinting at Praiseworthy. It's none of my business, he said, crossing his fat arms. But do you even stand under that umbrella in indoors? The cabin leaks shamefully, answered Praiseworthy. But it ain't raining. One can never be too careful in these latitudes, said the butler. Good day, sir. The cook laughed, shaking his head, and Praiseworthy folded the umbrella. When Jack glanced back at the porthole, his eyebrows jumped an inch. The pig had vanished. Look, Jack gasped, he's, he's gone. I declare, said Praiseworthy in genuine surprise. He stuck his head through the porthole and looked around. There wasn't a soul in sight, or a pig either. Jack left the cabin and ran out on deck where he found Mountain Jim seated on an overturned barrel and playing Oh Susanna on a mouth organ. Have you seen a black pig, sir? Jack asked out of breath. Seen him? The mountain man grinned. Why, boy, I'm sitting on him. And he tapped the side of the barrel with his harmonica. Jack wiped the sweat from his forehead and began to smile. Thank you, Mountain Jim, sir. The porker was safe, at least for the time being. I thought I'd need bear grease to get him out of that porthole. Sit down, Jack boy, and we'll do a bit of singing to pass the time. I'll learn you how to trap a grizzly. A boy your age needs all the educating he can get. Jack seated himself beside the mountain man on the top of the barrel. Soon he was singing to the windy accompaniment of the mouth organ, drowning out any snorts or grunts of protest from the pig. Oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me. I'm going to California with my washboard on my knee. When the cook passed, Mountain Jim lifted his yellow bobcat cap with one big hand and went on playing the harmonica with the other. After dinner and well after dark, Jack returned for the pig. A few feet away stood the small stern boat with a canvas thrown over it. He waited until the after deck was clear of passengers. Then he lifted the barrel, gave the porker a hug, and shoved him over the gunwale of the boat. Done, he said, straightening out the canvas. He supposed this cat and mouse game of cook and pig was doomed, but he wasn't giving up. Good night, good luck, he whispered. The pig replied with a snort of true love and began scratching his back on the underside of the boat. Sunday passed without roast pork for dinner, and the following night, the Lady Wilma anchored off the green coast of Brazil. With the coming of dawn, the side wheeler entered the channel and passed under the fortress guns of Rio de Janeiro. Praiseworthy and Jack stood on the full school with a warm breeze snapping their trousers. It seemed to Jack that he had almost forgotten what land looked like. The mere sight of a hill or distant trees excited him. And then the sunny harbor came into view with church bells ringing out across the water. House windows reflected the dazzling morning sun. Homesick, Master Jack, asked Praiseworthy in a quiet voice. Jack looked up. I wish Aunt Arabella and Constance and Sarah were with us, but of course the gold country is no place for women and children. It's not too late to change your mind, Master Jack. Change my mind? The butler rubbed the tip of his sharp nose and looked down into Jack's eyes. Cape Horn lies ahead of us. It's a bad stretch of water. Very bad, indeed, the captain tells me. 
The wind comes howling in like banshees, and the waves can batter a ship to splinters. No one will think the less of you, Master Jack, if you lay if you leave the Lady Wilma here at Rio, we'll manage to get you a passage back to Boston. Jack turned away from Praiseworthy's gaze and tightened his eyes against the breeze. He felt a welling up inside him. Didn't Praiseworthy want him along any longer? I'm not scared, he answered finally. The thought hadn't crossed my mind. You said we were partners. We are indeed, but I could never forgive myself if... Do you think we'll get smashed to splinters? The Lady Wilma is a stout ship. Do you think Captain Swain's a good master? None better, answered Praiseworthy. Jack looked back up into the butler's eyes. Go home? How could he go home without his pockets full of gold nuggets? Then I'm going on to California, the boy said. I'm not turning back. No, sir. He wiped his nose. But if you don't want me for a partner anymore, why, I'll... Don't talk nonsense, interrupted Praiseworthy with a sudden smile as bright as the morning. You said exactly what I thought you would, but I had to be sure. You'll do, Master Jack, you'll do. He put a hand on the boy's shoulder and Jack looked up. He could feel the reassuring grip, grip of Praiseworthy's fingers. The butler winked and Jack smiled. He wiped his nose again. Above them, in the pilot house, Captain Swain was looking for the sea raven among the ships at anchor. Their masts were as thick as reeds in a pond. Many were gold ships like the Lady Wilma herself, pausing to take on fresh water and supplies. When the customs boat came alongside, Captain Swain shouted down, Is the sea raven in port, sir? No, Captain, she left us five days ago. The ship's master greeted this news with his familiar roar, Blast! Well, we won't talk, wait, we won't tarry. By grabs, we'll sail tomorrow with the ongoing, with the outgoing tide. While the Lady Wilma took on coal and fresh provisions, the gold seekers invaded the city. There were Americans everywhere. Jack posted his letter. If he had found his sea legs, he had lost his land legs. The cobbled streets of Rio seemed to pitch and roll under him. Praiseworthy had to use his umbrella as a cane until the city stopped heaving about. Throughout the day, ships could be seen arriving and departing. Old Freds from New Bedford or Salem or Concord met on streets thousands of miles from home. That night, when Praiseworthy and Jack returned to their ship, their arms were loaded with exotic fruits never seen at home in Boston bananas and pineapples and guavas. When they awoke the next morning, the Lady Wilma was already setting a sea course with the outgoing tide. Jack stood at the cabin porthole and watched the city slip away, holding up its windows like mirrors to the pink dawn sky. After breakfast, Jack started out for the stern boat with table scraps for good luck. Suddenly, he heard the blare of Dr. Buckby's alarm trumpet. A moment later, the horse doctor appeared from a passageway with the trumpet at his lips and his cheeks swelled out like apples. The noise brought passengers from every direction. It's stolen, Dr. Buckby wailed, pausing for breath. Gone! What's this, said Praiseworthy, interrupting a stroll around Dick. What's gone? My gold map! I'm ruined! The horse doctor gave a final wail on the trumpet. My brother arrested his bones, posted it to me as he lay dying in California, and now it's been stolen, gone. Cut eye Higgins, said Mountain Jim. But almost at once it was discovered that Cut eye Higgins, too, was gone. He had been forgotten in the haste of coaling and watering the ship. And when Jack reached the after deck, he found that good luck, too, was missing. Even the small stern boat was there no more. All that remained was the canvas shaped over two empty boxes and a keg. The scoundrel, Captain Jack stormed. He must have lit out the night we lay off Rio, waiting to enter the channel. Rode himself ashore. Turn back, commanded Dr. Buckby, waving his tin trumpet and going around in a circle on his peg leg. Impossible, answered the ship's master unhappily. Then I'm ruined, sir, ruined. 
Nonsense, said Praiseworthy. I dare say there's more than one gold mine in California. You may be the first man among us to strike it rich. Jack said nothing about the pig. In the darkness and hurry of his escape, Cut-Eye Higgins must not have realized that he had a curly-tailed companion aboard the boat. Jack was sorry about Dr. Buckby and his treasure map, but he was pleased with good luck's good luck. The thief had no doubt beached the pig with the boat. Jack watched the green coast of Brazil slip further away and even smiled to himself. The porker was forever safe from the cook. So that's the end of chapter four. Check back in when we read chapter five.